Welcome, everyone. Tonight, um, again, we're going to be doing our class on my thoughts. It's changing the battery. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for coming. Welcome to our home and the uh, new normal. By the way, uh, if you have an interest in any of my lectures, over here it talks about this is my website besides uh, YouTube and Facebook that you can contact and see mess a, a lectures on getbasemordechai.com. So tonight's lecture and my thoughts is reading other people. I thought that was very important during this time. So the real question becomes, how are you at reading other people? Truthfully, most of us are totally illiterate. When it comes to men and women, it's usually even worse. There is a reason why they say that men are from Mars and women are from Venus. I really think that it's really kind of a broad brush. Granted, there are differences between the sexes, but I think it has more to do with personalities than really with gender. I think the biggest problem with reading people is that we don't read them. In reality, we read ourselves. When we listen to someone speak, we may find ourselves thinking, what do they really mean? And ignore what they have actually said completely. Or we try to read their body language, and good luck with that. I believe that, you can, that just as one can learn to read a foreign language, so too one can learn to read other people at least better and better. If we look in the Torah and study the life of Yosef, Joseph, I think we can learn a great deal about this issue. Yosef's brother, brothers sell him into slavery. The question is why? He seemed to love them and saw them as his brothers, his family. Why didn't they see him in the same light? Everything about Yosef and his relationship with his father was a recipe for disaster. Yosef's mother, Rachel, was Yaakov's favorite wife. And in reality, he was duped, Yaakov was duped into marrying Leah. Everyone, including her children, seemed to know that she was not loved, or at least not in the way that Yaakov loved Rachel. There may even have been some resentment between Yaakov and Leah. But matches, as we know, are made in heaven, whether we agree or not with the choice. In some very special way, Leah was God's primary choice for Yaakov. This point may be best illustrated by the fact that it is Leah who was buried with Yaakov in the Machpelah, not Rachel. All of Yaakov's children were special, superstars. Yet somehow, Leah's children were unique. Since they were chosen to serve as the priests, kings, and Torah scholars. Even Mashiach, the Messiah, will come. There will be a descendant through the lineage of King David, who was from the tribe of Yehuda, Leah's fourth son. Today we are all called Jews, which comes from the word Judah. Now Rachel was the last of the wives of Jacob, Yaakov, to bear his children. So one can only imagine the joy felt by both Yaakov and Rachel when Yosef was born. It was a time of great happiness. That was not the case with her second child, Binyamin, since she died giving birth to him. Understandably, Yaakov did not find the same joy in his relationship with Binyamin as he did with Yosef, who was born under much happier circumstances. So after Rachel's death, Yaakov became even more attached to his favorite son, Yosef. As a sign of his deep affection, Yaakov gave him what was called a kasonus pasim, a coat of many colors. Well, this opened up, open sign of affection, did not ingratiate Yosef to his brothers. In fact, it just increased the hostility that existed between them. The amazing part of all this was that somehow Yosef never realized just how wide the split between himself and his brothers really was. He read them totally wrong. He was only eight and a half when his mother died, and being the apple of his father's eye, it's logical to think he may have been a bit spoiled. He had his father's ear and would tell him things that he felt his older brothers were doing wrong. He felt justified, even righteous, doing so. But 
they saw him as a pursuer. Whenever there are two ways, there would be two ways to interpret anything that his brothers did. He would see it in the negative and run and tell his father. Now in his young and naive mind, he thought that they would appreciate that he was looking out for their spirituality. Not so. They only saw him as a spoiled brat, someone who was trying to turn their father against them. He would be their father's only heir, and they would be left with no connection to their father's inheritance, materially or spiritually. What they thought really did not come without precedence. Starting with the beginning of creation, Cain and Hevel. Cain was older, but Hevel, the younger brother, was chosen. With the three sons of Noah, Shem was the youngest, and he was chosen by his two older brothers, Ham and Yafas. Avram had eight sons, and only Yitzhak, his second son, was chosen. Yitzhak had two sons, and the younger son, Yaakov, was chosen over his older brother, Esau. So the brothers thought that history was about to repeat itself at their expense, all because of the gossip that this little spoiled brother was telling their father. They saw his clouded vision of them and their actions as being used to unjustly push them out so that he could take everything for himself. Now with all that, Yosef still didn't see the handwriting on the wall. He had grossly misjudged the whole situation. The proof that he really didn't get it was when his brothers, when he told his brothers about his dream. He told them, quote, We were binding sheaves in the field when my sheaf suddenly stood up erect. And then your sheaves formed a circle around my sheaf and bowed down to it. <laughs> the brothers said to him, Do you want to be our king? Do you, want to, do you intend to rule over us? And because of his dreams and his words, they hated him even more. But he really couldn't understand why were they so upset. They interpreted his dream, not him. Again, he read them wrong. He could see that he upset them again, which was really not his intent. So now he had another dream, and he wants to tell his brothers in the hope of making things better, actually. You know, they said to him that people dream about what they think about all day. And after thinking, giving some thought about what they said, he was able to understand why his, mo his brothers might think that he wanted to rule over them. So now he tells them, I had another dream. He said, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were all bowing down to me. <laughs> why would he tell them another dream? They were still churning about the first dream. Actually, he was trying to be very logical. First, he was sure that they did not believe that he would spend his day thinking that his father and mother would be bowing down to him. Secondly, since his mother had been dead for years, the dream couldn't be true. And third, and most important, the Talmud tells us that dreams follow the interpretation. So he believed by telling them his dream, they would interpret in a way that would suit their thoughts and feelings. It was up to them. But once again, he read them wrong. They saw him in one light, he saw himself in another. And the verse in 37, 4 states, they could not say a peaceful word to him. Where there is no communication in any relationship, there is no hope. Yosef was young and self-centered. He only saw himself. His dreams were about himself. It would take time and experience for him to grow into the great tzaddik that he would one day become. He would then be sold into slavery in Egypt. Slavery, by its very nature, forces one to look at someone else's needs before your own, whether you want to or not. And then he was thrown into prison. An even lower form of degradation and subjugation. What do we see? Through all of his difficulties that he was forced to endure, he had grown. He was no longer a self-centered, naive child. He was now a grown adult seasoned with years and experience. He was now able to look past his own existence and see and care about others. He was now able to read people without letting himself get in the way. Now, we see this with the story of the butler and the baker, two ministers of the king, who had been put into the same prison with Yosef. Now, one would think 
that if you were a minister to the king and he put you in prison, we have been waiting to hear your fate. You really wouldn't be in a good mood. But Yosef by now had learned to read people, their thoughts, their feelings, their desires. He could see more than on that on this special day, both the butler and the baker seemed to be a bit more distressed. Of course they were distressed. They were in prison, waiting to hear what their fate would be, if they would live or die. Hey, that could have distressed anyone. But no, Yosef, with his ability to read people, was able to see that on that day, it was different. The concern was deeper. He asked what was troubling them, and they both said they had dreamt a dream and they had no interpretation. So they told him their dreams and he interpreted them. And as he interpreted, so it was. He was now able to focus on others and not be blinded by his own self-image. He had grown. He was now ready to fulfill his destiny. He stands before Paro, the king of Egypt, not as a slave or a prisoner. He has reached his full glory and maturity. It is no longer about him. So when Paro asked him if he could interpret his dream, Yosef answers in Portion B Case 4116, It is not by my own power, but God may provide us an answer concerning Paro's fortune. He has learned true and complete nullification. He no longer existed. It was only God. And by the time he was reunited, reunited with his brothers, those that tried to kill him and then sold him into slavery, he almost had to remind himself of what they had done in the past. He was able to read their shock, embarrassment, and total confusion. It was as if someone had suddenly woken them up for a dream. They were startled. He read their thoughts perfectly. He was able to calm and comfort them, giving each one of them what they needed. They, on the other hand, could not read him. They looked into their own hearts and found little room for love and forgiveness. They thought, you know, Yosef must bear some sort of grudge against us. Who wouldn't? They were certain that one day, the day would come when he would unleash his true feelings and punish them severely. And we see this written in the verses of the portion of Vayachi, 5014, that after the burial of their father, Yaakov, it states, Yosef's brothers began to realize the implications of their father's death. They said, what if Yosef is still holding a grudge against us? He is likely to pay us back for all the evil we did to him. And this is 17 years after they came to Egypt. The brothers go to fire to make up a story to tell Yosef. They told the messengers to say to him, tell these are the, your father's last final instructions. Forgive the spiteful deed and the sin your brothers committed when they did evil to you. When Yosef heard this, he cried because they had read him wrong. He truly felt that all that had happened to him was the hand of God, and therefore it was God who made everything come out for the good. They had not reached his level, and that is why he is referred to as Yosef Atzadik, Yosef the Righteous One. This ability of being able to see past yourself is not something that you are born with, just the opposite. Babies are born selfish, mine, mine, it is our responsibility to train them, to teach them, to share, and to care for others. It's Herculean. We see that Yaakov was able to grow and see somehow someone else and what their issues about him were. His brother Asa. Asa felt that Yaakov, his brother, brother, had duped him twice. He felt that Yaakov had taken his birthright and then his blessings for success. He was livid. He planned to kill Yaakov for outsmarting him and then stealing his blessings. But Yaakov did what it says in Pirkei Avos, in chapter 2, first Mishnah 5, where Hillel says, Do not judge someone until you've reached his place. Yaakov put himself in Esau's place. He tried to address his brother's anger and his issues. He tried to read his mind. And so he did. He knew that his brother felt that he had slighted his honor and stolen his success. He assured his older brother that he had only one ox and one donkey, minimal things, and that he'd worked very hard for all that he possessed. 
His success did not come in the merit of the blessing that he stole. No. He told Asa he had to work day and night in the heat and the cold to be able to acquire the possessions that he had. And to placate Asa's greed, he sent him many herds of animals and even precious jewels. And then to soothe his bruised ego and to show honor to his older brother, he bowed down before him seven times. <laughs> he read Asa perfectly. And that was able to avoid an armed conflict with his brother. The Torah states in the portion of Vayishla 33.4 that he hugged Yaakov, meaning Asa, throwing himself on his shoulders, kissed him, and they both wept. The whole history of the Jewish nation depended on that moment whether Yaakov could diffuse the deep anger and hatred that festered in his brother's heart. He succeeded. You know, when you point a finger at someone at the same time, while you're pointing one finger at him, you're pointing three fingers at yourself. Much of the relationship that we have with other people really goes on in our minds. If we call someone or we text them and they don't answer immediately or not at all, well, then we think about so many different scenarios about what we did wrong. Why are they angry at us? <laughs> all negative. And many times they just got busy and forgot to call or text. And in the meantime, we have developed a whole series of negative thoughts and arguments in our mind about problems, a problem or problems that just don't exist. And this is why marriage by itself can be so challenging. When you stand in front of another person, your right hand is opposite their left hand. Your left hand is opposite their right hand. Your right eye is opposite their left eye and their left eye is opposite your right eye. So in reality, you are both looking at the same thing from a totally different perspective. You know, God called the wife an azer connecto, which means a helpmate opposite him. There are times when the same word can have two different meanings. <clears throat> Excuse me. For example, bi-weekly. It can mean once every two weeks, or it can mean twice in the same week. Similarly, the word connecto can mean opposite him, but it can also mean alongside, next to him. This translation tells us a great deal. If someone is opposite you, then their whole perspective <clears throat> is totally different than yours. But if they are standing next to you, then you both see the same thing and can more easily find a compromise. I think this is alluded to by the Jewish wedding ceremony. At a Jewish wedding, the groom is brought to the marriage canopy by his parents and he stands there under the canopy by himself, in his own circle. And so to speak, a self-centered individual. And then the bride is brought to the wedding canopy by her parents, and she circles the groom seven times. I believe this is an allusion to her trying to create a new circle. We know that a bias, a house, a woman is referred to as the bias. She's making a new house, a wider, more expensive, expansive circle. One that now includes her. After seven wines, he consents to widen his circle and let her stand beside him. Compromise. However, the compromise is short-lived. After all, the service continues, and now they turn and face each other. But they both extend their, extend their right hands. The hand, the right, that alludes to kindness. Of the same finger, as a sign of kindness and compromise. The chassan, the groom, then places the ring around her finger, finger signifying the circle of life. There now exists the possibility of opposition and controversy, but then they turn back and stand side by side with the hope that their marriage will be predicated on compromise, not controversy. So seeing their world in a vision of what we call shalom bias, peaceful and loving home. In contrast, I find it interesting that non-Jewish weddings, the bride and groom face each other, opposites. Whereas through most of the ceremony in a Jewish wedding, the bride and groom stand side by side, a hope for unity. If you want to know what someone really likes, see what they give you for a gift. Most people seem to assume that if they want something, then everyone else must also want the same item. Of course, it's not always the case. We are all different. We all need to spend some time learning how to become literate, how to read people. 
We need, we need to spend, find a way to spend, again, we spend so much time in this asylum that we call our minds and imaginations. Think good, have positive thoughts, err on the side of happiness rather than controversy. The third Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Samach Sadek, said, think good and it'll be good. Life is perception, not reality. It's amazing how much better and happier our lives would be we would change our perspective and see everyone in a positive light if we all stand next to each other rather than opposite each other. You know, we should all paint smiles on our face masks. We should all be kinder and try to find positive reading material in each and every person that we meet. And through our learning to take the time to read others properly, may we usher in the coming of Mashiach Sikainu quickly and in our time. And thank you very much for listening. God bless and uh, Shabbat Shalom. And on this special day also, this week of Shavuos, may we accept the Torah with uh, all the glory that God has, has given us and be able to bring in again the coming of Mashiach. Thank you.